Today we're continuing in the book of Acts. We just, last week was awesome, was it not? It was just beautiful. I love Easter Sunday. It's our Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. But what's beautiful is the next Sundays after that are just as powerful because we're living in the reality of the resurrection. And so we're going to continue in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 11, and um, we're going to continue our series. But as we do, I want you to consider this. Have you ever read about something and maybe or heard about it, maybe seen pictures of something, and you're like, wow, that's so cool? I'll tell you this. This that you know, you can read about something, you can hear about it, but to experience it is very different, and it's very true with the gospel. And so, I want to relate that to you today. I want you to think of this there's a, a personal illustration I'll use in my life. I heard about the Grand Canyon, I read about the Grand Canyon. But when I went and saw the Grand Canyon, it was breathtaking. There's no picture that could do justice to what I saw. There was nothing that could ever embody in words what I experienced. And like I said, the same is true with the gospel. You can hear about it. You can read about it. You can have others tell you about it. You can even intellectually believe it. But when you experience it, it's life transforming. And we're in this book of Acts where the gospel is going out to every nation, every people. It's amazing what's happening. And as we're reading through this passage, I want you to know this. This is not a story about the birth of the church. It's our story about the birth of the church. This is a part of our story. And so it's so exciting to begin. It's like taking the the picture album of the family and flipping it backwards and going, oh, my word. You know, they really wore things like that back then. Um, And here we're taking and we're flipping back and we're seeing a beginning, a beginning of the church. In Acts chapter 11, I'll set the scene because I'm going to focus on just a couple of verses today. But the scene is Peter is hearing that there are a lot of Jewish believers that are troubled or challenged with the reality that the gospel is going to all these Gentiles or these non-Jewish people. And so he reminds them in the first part of chapter 11, he says, listen, I want you to know that God gave me this vision. And in this vision, he clarified to me that the gospel was something that was gonna go to non-Jewish people because it was for everyone. He makes some incredibly powerful statements, and we're gonna look at them in a few moments in regard to that. But as he does that, they decide that some of these believers in these Gentile regions needed to be led. They needed some leadership, and so they send Barnabas And Barnabas goes out and he begins engaging these new believers. And this is where we're going to pick up the story. So we're going to look at verses 19 through 26 of chapter 11. It says this, Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose after Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. This is the verse we're going to spend most of our time. So Barnabas shows up. In verse 23, this is what it says. When he came and saw the grace of God, he was glad. And he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. 
And a great many people who were added to the Lord, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch, and for a whole year they met with the church and taught many people. And in the and in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So if you've ever wondered, how did we get that name? There we go. That's where people were first called Christians. Three things that I want to encourage you with today is we're going to focus on what it means to experience the fullness of the gospel. Experiencing the fullness of of the gospel. The first thing is found in the phrase in verse 23, and I want to highlight this that we must understand that the gospel is an act of grace. The gospel is an act of grace. Look at what it says when Barnabas arrives. The first thing that happens is it says, He came and saw the grace of God, and he was glad. Well, what's it mean that he saw the grace of God and he was glad? I believe that what it was is he saw a picture of grace that he couldn't comprehend any time before. Meaning this, that people who are non-Jewish had received the gospel, had received the spirit, and the church was growing way beyond what he could think or imagine. And he saw that God loved people that were unlike him. It's pretty powerful. Remember his vision? The sheet comes down, and, and God says two really, really powerful statements, and I'll refer to them right now. The first one is in verse 9, and he says this, What God has made clean do not call uncommon. And he is reminding them that this grace of God given to the Gentiles was done on purpose intentionally because God does not see people who are non-Jewish to be unclean. That the gospel was for everyone. It's pretty powerful. Verse 17, he, he then speaks to these Jewish people and he reminds them this. He says, God gave him the same gift of the Spirit that he gave to us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he makes this statement, who was I that I could stand in God's way? So he's kind of laying it down. He's reminding them, this isn't about a Jewish belief. This isn't just about a Jewish Messiah. This is about the Messiah who came to redeem all people, all nations, all creeds, all morality. It's the gospel of grace. You know what grace means? It means getting what you don't deserve. Getting what you don't deserve. And as you look at these Jewish people, initially, they didn't want the Samaritans to have the gospel. They didn't think the Gentiles deserved the gospel. They were different. They were unclean. And God says, no, no, everybody has access to the gospel. And this is what's most important. By definition, none of us deserve it. None of us deserve it. Have you ever been in a situation and you go, Whew, they're a unique person, you know, or you, you see somebody who, who's different from you. Let's just get real for a minute. Who do we view as worthy of the gospel? Conservatives? Morally upstanding? Americans? Where, where do we draw our line? when it comes to the gospel. You look across the street and you see somebody completely morally different than you and you go, whew, man, are they lost. Yep, just like you were. You see, that's where we've got to get to because when we see ourselves as in a better position to receive the gospel than those who appear to be far away from God, we have missed the fact that we didn't deserve it. That the very essence of the gospel is something that we did nothing to earn, we did nothing to merit. 
but it was offered to us. It is beautiful. So he begins and he reminds them, Samaritan, Gentile, or Jew, the gospel is for all. Who in your, your life, where is your line? Who is it that you look at and go, hmm, I don't know if they deserve it. Is it somebody on a political side? Is it somebody on a moral side? Is it somebody that's different in some other way? Remember, the gospel of grace is undeserved for them and for you, and that's what makes it grace. Hmm, that's good. That is good. So he begins this verse, and then he has two statements, and I'm going to focus on them in these next uh, few moments. He continues down through, and he says, yes, it's a gospel of grace, and it says, and he was glad. And then he says this, and he exhorted them. This is kind of where he's getting down to it, going, okay, boys, all right, ladies, listen up. I got something for you. And he says, he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose. The first part is that first phrase, to remain faithful to the Lord. I'm going to make a statement. I want, to, I want you to really hold on to this. We must understand that the gospel is more than a decision. All right? You there? The gospel is more than a decision. It's important that we recognize this, although it, it involves a decision. It's more than a decision. And so that's why... Barnabas comes in and he doesn't go, you did it. Woo. He says, no, remain faithful. Remain faithful to what first you received. I look at it this way. Uh, I think of a wedding. I had a wedding yesterday. It was, it was great. I always love it when the bride and the groom are standing in front of me and they're peering into each other's eyes and they're like little, you know, they're stars and they're just, you know, they're on another planet and they're just enjoying that moment. And I'm like, they have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> love is blind. It's blind. And, 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 and so, you know, they, they make these commitments, better or worse, rich or poor, sickness and health, you know, and all of this. And they make these commitments and then it's like, whoo, we're done. We're out of here. I did it. We're married. We don't have to worry about anything else, right? No. What happens is the wedding is the first step of a lifetime that they've committed to each other. Stick with me here. I want you to see this. When we confess Jesus is our Savior, it's our commitment, our decision it's the beginning, not the end. Some people see like, yeah, I accepted Christ 20 years ago. What have you done since then? I accepted Christ 20 years ago. I know. Are you serving him? Do you love him? Are you, you know, doing things to further his kingdom? I accepted Christ 20 years ago. Listen, I want you to hear this. A decision for Christ is not the end. It's the beginning. It's like the marriage vows. It's the commitment to a life that you're walking into. And so he says this. Barnabas says, remain faithful. Remain faithful. And what it, that means is, with a devoted heart, stay faithful to the person that you've committed to. Stay faithful to the person you've committed to. It's interesting as we look at this passage and we begin to understand the gospel, I want you to hear this. The beauty of the gospel is experienced when we make the decision, but I'm here to tell you, my wife and I, we've been married 33 years. We don't look that old. I know that, don't tell me. But I'm here to tell you that some of the best years were not 
at the moment of our commitment. They were after the moment where we got to experience life and relationship and beauty and all of this. And I'm here to tell you, people have missed what salvation is all about if they've only made a decision and missed what it means to live in the fullness of that relationship. It's not a finish line that you've crossed. It's a door that you've opened, a threshold that you're walking through to begin something beautiful that God intended for a lifetime. The third thing is that we must understand the gospel gives us purpose in life. The next phrase he says in this verse, when he came, he saw the grace of God and he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with what? With steadfast purpose. For he was a good man full of the Holy Spirit in faith. People are looking for purpose in life. They're wondering, why am I here? What is this about? And I'm here to declare to you, you don't define your purpose. You don't define your purpose. You can try. You can say, well, I think my life should be about this. Your purpose is given to you by the God who created you. Listen, I can have a hammer, and maybe that hammer, although this hammer was made for a specific reason, it wants to be a screwdriver. And as much as I try to use it like that, it doesn't function well. The hammer is best used in the way the craftsman intended it, designed it, purposed it. And the same thing is true with us, that with steadfast purposes, know why you exist. Know why you're here. Don't look back and wonder, what is life all about? Let God show you the purpose that he created you for. There's two areas of purpose that I want to just shed some light on. The first one is this. It's the general purpose that we have as believers. And that is to glorify God in everything and to share the gospel with those around us. That's, you, you don't get a choice. If you're a believer, that's one of the purposes that God has placed in us. Go represent me. Share the gospel with the world. You're a missionary. Your reflection of Jesus to the world, your light in darkness, that's part of your purpose. So don't go to your job and say, man, I got to get out of there to hang out with some Christians. Go to your job and shine some light. Shine some light in your community. Shine some light in your friend group. Most courageous thing you could ever do is in the midst of a friend group that is far from Jesus is share and shine the light of the gospel. Let them see something that's distinct and beautiful. Have the courage to do that. It's powerful. You want to talk about purpose? Purpose, that's your general purpose. Specific purpose is this. God created you different than me. He created you different than any other person in this room. I admire engineers. Some of you here are engineers. I don't understand you. <laughs> I don't get you. Everything's a chart. Everything is a process. And I'm like, let's just do it. And they're like, mm, doesn't quite work that way. Here's the org chart. I'm like, what? Listen, I can't be you. And let's be honest, you can't be me. We'd be both really bad there. The reality is God has given you something specific when he designed you. 
You didn't get a choice to your personality and to your gifts and your abilities. Oh, they're really good at this. Oh, they're really artsy over here. Oh, you ought to see them play sports. You ought to see them build a house. You ought to see the way they design. Listen, that's beautiful. You didn't create it. The God who created you, formed you, knit you together in your mother's womb, gave you those specific talents, those gifts, those abilities. And it's what we do with those that's most important. That's our specific purpose. That we take what God has woven into us and we say, God, I'm not using it for my kingdom. I'm going to redeem it for yours. I'm going to redeem it for yours. It's your specific purpose. There's a passage in Scripture in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30, that Jesus tells this parable. It's a story of the talents. He said he gave each one different, you know, set of talents. And the only thing he said was the requirement wasn't what I gave you. It was what did you do with what I gave you? And we could get to a place in life where we look back and go, I wish I, I, wish, wish I would have used that for the kingdom. I wish I would have used that not just, you know, to fund this or accomplish that. I wish I would have used it for the Lord. See, your specific purpose is to take your talent, is to take your gifts, your abilities, the way God has formed you, and release them into God's hands and say, use them for your kingdom. Use them for your kingdom. Isn't that beautiful? So Barnabas shows up and he goes, I see the sea of grace. I see God's grace in this amazing way. That every person, every nation, every ethnicity, every morality, God has extended grace to. The gospel is available to everyone. And then he says, I want you to understand that the gospel is not just a decision. A decision is the first step in a lifetime of an experience of walking with him and doing life with him. And as you do to recognize the purpose that God has woven inside of you, I don't know who you are, how God has created you, but there's two people that know it specifically, you and the God who created you. So don't search for purpose. I need purpose in life. I need this. Look at how God created you. Release it for his glory. Further his kingdom. And remember your general purpose is shine light in darkness. Love people like God loved you. So I'll leave you with these three questions or statements. The first one is this, let your heart rejoice because God extended the gospel to you when you didn't deserve it. If Man, I, I just don't want to overlook that today. When we look in and we feel that God was lucky to have us, we're in, some, we're in some trouble, my man. None of us deserved it. You can't earn it. And the reality is, it was a gift to every one of us. I don't care how moral you are. I don't care if you're an elder, a deacon, a pastor. All of us are sinners separated from God. And by the grace of God, he gave us what we didn't deserve. He offered us salvation. Hmm. Rest in that. Rejoice in that. The second thing is this. Could it be said of you that you are living a life that is faithful to the Lord? Or maybe is your story more about a decision that you made one day? Don't forget it's like the marriage. It's a decision that was intended to be a doorway to a lifetime of a relationship with the God who created you. It's like going to the Grand Canyon that you will experience something that words could never embody. 
There is no better life than the Christian life to experience what it means to walk with God. So as Barnabas said, I will declare to you, remain faithful. Remain faithful. No matter where you are, take the next step of advancing the kingdom of God. The third thing is, are you searching for purpose or are you living out the purpose God has given you? Out of all people in the world, Christians should be, we should be zeroed in on this. We should get this. The world may be searching for purpose, but we know our creator. We know who knit us together in our mother's womb. We know we're unique, and that can have many forms. But the truth is God designed us. Release it for his kingdom. Release it for his kingdom. So, Father, this morning, as we consider these things, oh, my heart rejoices in your goodness, in your grace, in your patience. God, help us to remain steadfast and faithful. Help us to live in the fullness of our purpose and experience the beauty and the wonder of what you've designed for us and what you desire for us, God. And we just pray all of these things in the name of our great Savior. Amen.